Hi everyone, I'm Eileen from Raycraft Books and welcome back to Magic Mirror Night. We are reading The Tomb of Time and in the last scene, Marco and Miranda's identity had been exposed. So let's go see what happens next. Chapter 10, The Ultimate Power. The craftsman's daughter circled Mira warily. I don't know who you are or where you are from, but you are not from the palace. That's true, but please don't get us into trouble. We don't want to cause anyone any harm, really. Are you spies? Thieves? No, we're not. Really, we're not. But what are you here for? We have to get something from the royal chamber in the necropolis, correct? Mira did not reply. So you are thieves. No, said Mira. We don't want to take anything that belongs to the emperor. We just want to get the cube that An Shi Sheng left to make it disappear. Marco butted in. We should just tell her who we are. I was just about to said Mira. We're the grandchildren of Ang Shi Sheng. Only where we come from, he has a different name. Yeah, said Marco, nodding, a serious expression on his face, and we don't call him Ang Shi Sheng. We just call him Grandpa, or Ye Ye, which in Chinese is a nickname kind of thing with the same meaning. The girl stared at them, not knowing what to believe. Mira took hold of Shao Ta's hands and spoke as sincerely as she could. Look at me. Women know when people are lying, right? I'm not lying. You know I'm not. I'm the granddaughter of the man you call An Shi Sheng. And he, he asked us to get the cue back so that the prophecy can be fulfilled. But what is it? asked Shao Ta. Mira looked at her brother and bit her lip. This is going to sound really weird, she said, but we don't know. We were just told that we had to go and get it. Shao Ta released her hands from Mira's. She walked away. Without turning, she said, can you prove any of this? Look at our clothes, Marco said. Have you ever seen anything like them? Shao Ta turned and walked back to her friend. She touched the material. I have seen nothing like this, not here nor in the big city. This material is so amazing, finer than the finest silk. Yeah, it's kind of okay, I guess. It's called polyester. Funny how you guys like this stuff. Where we come from, nobody likes it. Show her the locket, said Marco. And there's this, his sister added. She pulled out the locket. This is a picture of our grandfather. Shao Ta looked at the tiny image. This is Ang Shi Sheng, she said in a gasp. It is so real. I have never seen a painting which looked so real. Marco smiled. Yeah, where we come from, the artists are really skilled. We call them photographers. They can paint something like that in a few seconds. In fact, to be technically correct, in one hundredth of a second. Click, just like that. Mira spread her palms in a gesture of pleading. So have we convinced you? Do you believe we are the grandchildren of a thousand-year-old magician? Shao Ta remained silent. Wait said Marco. Remember the sorcerer talked of the magician having a small vase containing the sun? Shao Tai's eyes widened. I have it in my pocket, said Marco. Come inside. You can appreciate it more. The three children ran to one of the tunnel openings and hurried down a ladder into the darkness. Once they were in a place where there was almost no light, Marco spoke again. Where are you, Shao Ta? 
I'm here, came the voice. Okay, look in the direction of my voice. I'm going to turn it on. After a count of three, one, two, three, there was a click, but the darkness remained. Oops, sorry, said Marco. Let me just try that again. One, two, three. He clicked the flashlight switch, but nothing happened. Mira was irritated. What are you doing? Can't you turn it on? Here, give it to me. I'm trying, said her brother. It's broken or ran out of batteries or something. She heard him rattling and shaking it. It won't come on. Give it to me, said Mira. No, said Marco. Give it to me, shouted his sister. No, said Shouta. There is no need. Let's go back. They heard her moving back towards the tunnel entrance and quickly followed her. As they half ran along the passage, she explained, there's no reason to see the sun in a vase. Your sister is right. Women can tell when people are lying. My mother told me that before she, you are not lying. I believe you are the children of the children of Anki Sheng. They reached the tunnel entrance where they had entered, but Xiao Ta did not move up the ladder. Instead, she turned into the darkness in a different direction. What are you doing? Are we not going out? Mira asked. In the half light from the tunnel entrance, they saw Xiao Ta, her face serious. We are going to, to a chimney hall where, where fire is kept burning to collect lanterns. She said, then we are going to the forbidden royal chamber. There you will meet the ghost brigade, if you wish. I do not promise that you will enjoy the experience. As they walked, Xiao Ta told them about the emperor and his family. The emperor is a cruel man. Everybody knows that. When we first heard of him, he seemed to be such a great hero. He united all the countries into one and became the ruler of all, the first emperor of all the civilized lands in the world, all under heaven. That's what we said he had achieved. All countries, said Mira, not ours. If you are from Mount Pinglao, that is also in our kingdom on its very edge. And there are other lands, they say, beyond the seas, but they are manned only by savages, not fully human. Marco said, so he was the first hero? He was a hero at first. Yes, but slowly things changed. He became evil. He became cruel and harsh. He killed one advisor and then another and another. Then last year, he did something that shocked everybody. He killed the intellectuals. He killed 460 writers and scientists. Many said they were the wisest people in the kingdom. Xiao Ta's face became heavy and she looked down. They could see tears swimming in her eyes. Mira said, your mother? The girl nodded. She was the first woman alchemist, and probably the last. Did anyone try to stop him? Asked Marco. No one dared. Who would dare to criticize someone who kills his friends, let alone his enemies? But then, one day, one person did stand up to him. Fusu, the oldest son, said the boy excitedly. I read about him in Grandpa's history book. Xiao Ta nodded. His oldest son, Fusu, was a good and fearless man. Mira said, and probably the only person that the emperor would not kill for criticizing him. He wouldn't kill his own family members, would he? Xiao Ta turned to Mira, her face stern. You know so little. You need education. He killed my members, many members, many, many members of his own family, including children he had fathered.
Many of his wives and concubines tried to get as far away from him as possible, which is why at first I was not surprised when you knew so little about palace life. Marco said, but he didn't kill his son. What with him being like firstborn, the heir to the throne, that kind of thing? Shao Ta turned to him. No, you are right, but he banished him. He sent him to work in the far part of the kingdom where he could cause no trouble. Instead, he made his brother, Hu Hei, his heir. This is a great tragedy for the kingdom because Hu Hei is just like his father. Hard and cruel, they walked in silence for a while. Tonight is a very important night, said Mira. We have a way of knowing when important things are going to happen and it tells, it tells us that everything changes tonight. It's kind of hard to explain. Suddenly an adult male voice spoke. Change may be good or it may be bad. The three children startled, spun on their heels. Craftsman Tang stepped out of the shadows. I heard your voices. These tunnels echo a great deal. Sound travels. Mira got the message. He was warning them. He was warning them to keep their secrets more tightly to their chests. The man continued speaking. You are right when you say that tonight is a special night. Rumor has it that there is going to be a meeting between father and son this night. The emperor has left the palace. He is on the road. He will meet Fusu. If they do meet, we can only hope that there will be a reconciliation, that the emperor will realize that what he did was wrong and Fusu's criticism was meant to love, kindness. But there are other rumors that tell us a different story. Shao Ta looked at her father but said nothing. What are they? Marco asked in a nervous whisper. The other rumor says that the emperor will hand his son a death paper. Shao Ta gulped and dropped her eyes. That would be bad. Wait, said Mira. What is a death paper? There are many ledgers who can order people to be put to death, said Tang. There have been many in history, but this emperor wants to show that he is more powerful than any who have gone before. He wishes to be seen as a god, so he writes notes ordering people to kill themselves. Mira, Mira's eyes were wide. And do they? Tang nodded. They do. But, but why? Marco asked. It is the ultimate power. The emperor wants power over more than just the bodies of his people. He wants power over the will of his people. To kill someone takes nothing but a few soldiers, but to order people to kill themselves and have that order followed, that, is the greatest power that a man can have, power over the human will. Marco shook his head. This guy is a major baddie, he said, folding his arms. I wish I hadn't pretended to be his son. As they stepped into the light, they became aware of a great commotion that was going on. Craftsman Tang grabbed the shoulder of one of the men running past. What's happening? Why all the noise? The man turned to him, fear in his eyes. We have an unexpected visitor, he said. The Supreme Minister of Justice is here. Tang let the man go, and he disappeared as fast as he could. Marco asked, Minister of Justice? Is he a good guy? That's the sort of title a good guy should have. Tang looked serious. He is not, as you say a good guy. Lisi is the most dangerous man in the kingdom, the king's personal killer. Ew, said Mira. You mean like he's an ex executioner? 
the craftsman shook his head. No, if you get sent to an executioner, you count yourself lucky. That's far better than being sent to Li Si, who is the chancellor of fear. He is a master in the art of pain. They call him the master of slow death. Mira and Marco had been stepping steadily backwards as Tang was speaking. They wanted to get as far away from the new arrival as possible. Then they heard the clattering of hooves and a cloud of dust rose in the air to their left. Four horsemen appeared out of the dust and came straight towards the small group and quickly surrounded them. Shao Ta hid behind her father while Mira and Marco stood in front of him. The largest of the four men spoke. The minister of justice wishes to see the two thieves who have been pretending to be the children of his divine highness, the emperor. They are to be executed immediately. They are just children, Tang said, playing a game. They are not thieves. The man on horseback glared at him. You say one more word, craftsman and you will suffer the same fate. Two men dismounted and slung chains around Mira and Marco. This is not good, Marco said. Think of something. That's your job, his sister replied. Chapter 11, The Chancellor of Fear. They were taken by the guards to the palace of the master of slow death and left outside. Half an hour later, guards came and dragged them in by their chains. The master of slow death was a rake thin man with a clear complexion and soft features. He wore long pale yellow robes ornately embroidered with purple thread. He spoke quietly, almost in a whisper, but his eyes were hard and cruel. What's that bag thing on the boy's back, he asked. The guards pulled Marco's backpack away from him. At first, they couldn't work out how to undo the zipper. But by tugging at the bag in various directions, the zipper eventually slid down. One guard, a man with a flat nose and a jutting chin, pulled out the magic mirror. The Chancellor of Fear gestured to the man to bring it over. I've heard about these, he said in his soft drawl. A magic mirror made of special bronze, special bronze alloy, so I hear. Very valuable, very unusual properties. Who did you steal it from? The last phrase was loud and harsh. It belongs to our grandfather, An Shi Sheng, said Mira. Marco was nervous about most things, but the Mira was one thing he could fiercely fight for. Because the thing he was scared about most was losing the Mira and not being able to return to the present day. Give it back. The boy said, it's ours. Lisi looked it over on both sides. Just a piece of nicely carved junk, he said, his voice quiet and calm and... Now, shall I drop you two in the vat or drop your little trinket in? The two children looked up at the cruel man. What did he mean? What was he talking about? What was the vat? Lisi turned to the guard. He said, drop it into vat number seven. That's bronze alloy, and we do need a bit more there. Give it back, Marco barked. The Supreme Minister of Justice suddenly shouted, evil thieves, your little trinket is going to be melted down just over there. You can watch if you like. He gestured to one of his staff members to pull open the door of the palace.
they saw the soldier march to the foundry outside where furnaces roared and vats of molten metal stood. The soldier tossed the disc up to one of the workers with a shout. The man grabbed the mirror and glanced at it. The soldier, unable to shout over the roar of the flames, pointed to the vat and then pointed back to the palace of Lisi. The message was clear. The emperor's envoy wanted the magic mirror thrown into the molten metal vat to be melted into nothing. No! shouted Marco, but it was too late. The man dropped the magic mirror. The white hot bubbling liquid fizzed slightly, just as it swallowed it up. Marco froze in horror. Mira, on one of the very rare occasions of her life, was completely silent. Bye bye, little trinket, said Lisi sweetly. The man seemed to constantly swing between towering rage and absolute tranquility. This made him even more terrifying. The Supreme Minister of Justice turned to the guards who were still in the room. Take these two brats and give them to the ghost brigade. The guards froze, suddenly nervous. What's wrong, said Lisi, did you not hear me? Yes, sir, said the guards, still looking scared. Lisi added, and go back an hour later for the corpses. We must tidy up after ourselves, keep the necropolis clean. Marco didn't speak for over 10 minutes. He just walked in silence, gazing into the middle distance. This was a problem. As far as Mira was concerned, since she badly needed his help in working out what they were going to do, she remembered her favorite teacher, Ms. Modi, saying that super imaginative children often worried more than other children about things since they could picture all the possible bad things that could happen in terrifying detail, whereas ordinary children could just get on with things. Mira really, really wanted to take some sort of drastic action. She and Marco were being frog-marched along the hall to the entrance to the ghost of Rina. They either needed to break free and run off, difficult, since they had guards on either side of them, or they needed to stay put and allow themselves to be taken to the place where the ghosts were. Since it was where the entrance to the emperor's royal chamber was, and that was where they needed to go. And then there was a bigger question to deal with. One was how, how to stop the ghosts killing them once they were there. And if they survived that, how to get home without the magic mirror. Moonlight shining through the mirror was the only way they knew of transporting themselves between their usual world and the world they were in at the moment. Suddenly, Marco spoke. It's gone, he murmured, toneless as a zombie. It's gone, she agreed. We lost it. He said nothing for a while and then, in the same toneless voice, said, oops. For some reason, this annoyed her, oops. Did you say oops? He nodded. The mirror. The mirror, our only chance of getting back to our own time and place is gone. And you say oops? Well, it is a bit of a downer, isn't it? We'll never get home. Never, ever, ever will be stuck here forever and ever and ever and ever, etc. Downer, that's almost as bad as oops. Bummer, shut up. Well, you get angry. You get angry at anything I say, but you don't say anything yourself because I don't have an intelligent function, functioning person with a brain to say it to. I only have you, my half-wit brother. Is it not a bit of a downer? 
It's a tragedy. It's a nightmare. It's horrible. It's not a bit of a downer. It's, it's, it's a disaster. We'll never see our parents again. We'll never see our friends again. We'll never see our house again. I'll miss the end of the year school dance. He nodded. I know. If we had to get stuck somewhere in time, it's a pity it's here. I mean, there have been lots of emperors and kings and stuff, but I can't think of many who did more killing of his own people than this one. They reached the tunnel entrance. Mira said, unfortunately, we may be next on the list, unless we can think of something pretty darn quick. On the orders of the Supreme Minister of Justice, these two are to be fed to the ghost brigade, the soldier barked to the craftsman Tang. They're just children. They won't last a minute. The soldiers glared at him. May I suggest, no, barked the larger of the two soldiers. You may not suggest anything. The orders are to deliver these two to the ghost brigade and collect their corpses afterwards. Okay said Craftsman Tang, follow me. They pulled the chains off the children. Metal was valuable and could not be wasted on junior corpses. They walked down a pitch black tunnel lit by candles and sconces on the walls. They got to a large wooden door, which he unlocked with two keys. He carried a lit torch through the darkness down another tunnel, this one unlit until they reached another wooden door. This one had to be opened with three keys. The blackness and silence was oppressive and the tunnel was becoming increasingly creepy. How far now? Asked one of the soldiers, a trace of nervousness creeping into his voice. We have another passage before we get to the area where the ghosts roam. Of course, sometimes they come out of the area and get quite a long way down these tunnels to be, so be careful. What do you mean they get out, said the soldier, coming to a sudden halt. How far do they come? About this far, said Tang. The soldier made a decision. We'll stay here. You take them into the final room. Very well. Craftsman Tang moved away with the two children. Since he had a torch, the two soldiers were soon left in the dark. Wait, said one of the soldiers, come back. You leave us the torch, you can go ahead in the dark. Tang turned back and handed the torch to the soldiers. Then he and the children moved forward into the dark. They were soon lost to view. Wait, they heard the soldier say again, we, we can't see you. Craftsman Tang replied with infinite patience in his voice, you can't see us because you have the torch. If you want to see us, give us the torch. We're keeping the torch, said the soldier. Right, said his companion, we're keeping the torch. Tang said they would stomp loudly on the floor to prove that they were heading away from there. You'll hear our feet as we move away, getting quieter. Then you'll hear me unlocking the final door, pushing the children in and then relocking the door. Then you'll hear me coming back alone. Then I will return to you and we will go back to the world of the living together. Is that all right? Yes, just do it now and, and be quick, said the soldier. There was silence except for the shuffling of feet as Tang and the two children headed into the final passage. Tang whispered to them, I'll try to make enough noise for all three of us. You two sneak back, go quietly. Flatten yourselves against the wall on the right. Sneak past the soldiers. Won't the men see us when we get close to them? Mira asked. Tang said, no, I gave them a short torch. It'll go out very soon. They'll be waiting in the dark. The craftsman's plan worked like a dream. Within minutes, the soldier's torch had gone out and the two men were standing in the dark. The two children sneaked back and went right past them. Mira, feeling wicked, gave a tiny high-pitched howl as she passed them. What was that? 
said one of the men. It sounded like a ghost. I heard it too, said the other, and it's close to us. Marco blew in the direction of the voices. Did you feel that? It's breathing. It's behind us, said the other. The two children got to the wooden door, swung it open and entered the next passage, resisting the temptation to laugh at the terrified soldiers in the dark behind them. Keep going, whispered Mira to Marco. When the soldiers get too scared, they'll run out of the passage in this direction and we want to be well clear by then. They reached the final door just as they heard the soldiers approaching. The men had clearly reached their limits of endurance. Mira and Marco raced through the dark and found the final door. They yanked it open and had to shield their eyes against the brightness. Mira blinked. She heard her brother say, uh-oh. She opened her eyes wider. There were several men standing in their way and they carried gleaming torches. Right in front was the Prince of Pain, Lee C. Well, 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 said the Supreme Minister minister of justice in his creepy voice. Well, 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 look what we have here. I rather suspected that those idiots would not be up to the job, so I decided I would come and make sure the job was done myself, properly. And what a good thing I did. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Tomb of Time. Hope you enjoyed these chapters and join us again for more. In the meantime, please go to our Raycraft YouTube channel where you can catch up on all of the previous chapters and be ready for the next installment. See you soon.